Hey, this is Mike Cashew, and you're listening to the Brute Strength Podcast. This week, I interviewed Chad Vaughn, two-time Olympian. We talk a lot about the experiences that led to him being so dominant in the sport of weightlifting, his transition from being an athlete to a coach, and how conserving energy played such a huge role in his success overall. Enjoy the show. Hey, if you've got a question about health and fitness, mindset, or even life in general that you'd like me or one of my guests to answer, I'd love to hear from you. To do so, call into the Brute Hotline at 801-449-0503. Talk to you soon. Hey, this is Mike Cashew, and this is the Brute Strength Podcast. I'm here with Chad Vaughn. Uh, he doesn't need much of an introduction, but for those of you who are not uh, too weightlifting savvy, he's a two-time Olympian, the 2003 Pan American gold medalist, as well as a nine-time national champion. Chad, thanks for carving some time out of your day to do this with me, man. Absolutely. I'm glad to do it. I'm, I'm excited you're here. I'm excited to, to chat with you a little bit. Well, I, I, uh, I got to know you probably starting three or four years ago during the advanced, the CrossFit advanced weightlifting course. And so I got to see you um, as a coach, you know, and I got to admire you as a coach. But through that, we didn't really discuss a lot of what it was like for you as an athlete. Um, and so where I want to start is I'm, I'm very curious. You're, you're incredibly soft spoken and yet you do one of the most powerful and you did one of the most powerful sports in the world, which is weightlifting. So what were you like as an athlete and like, what were you like in the gym? Yeah. I mean, like you said, I'm definitely a, a, a quiet guy as a kid growing up. I was, you know, shy, uh, definitely around people that I don't know. I still am. I'm still kind of awkward in social situations. I was telling you before this that, that uh, I enjoy speaking and uh, commentating and doing podcasts and stuff like that, and, but, uh, but I'm definitely different uh, stepping away from that. So as an athlete, I was very quiet as well. I was very inward, um, uh, don't show a lot of emotion. And you know, one, of the, one reason why is just my, my personality, but another thing too is for me it was energy conservation, and mm-hmm. it is energy conservation, you know, to, to just, um, you know, there were definitely times where I blew up in the gym and I threw weights and stuff like that. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but for the most part, I was able to shake it off and just stay calm and conserve that energy and put it into figuring out where do I need to go from here or, uh, you know, to the next lift. Right. What is it? What does it look like when you get really excited? Is it kind of just like this it's, or? Yeah, it's very much like this. I mean, it. I think, man, they made fun of me for years. Um, I don't know if it was after I broke the American record or I made a, a lift that, that a big lift that won the competition or something. And, and all I did was I just gave it just a little, <laughs> yeah. just a little fist like that. And so, you know, uh, Jody and, uh, uh, my wife, Jody and her coach Ursula definitely made fun of me for, for many years for that, that mm-hmm. little celebration that I did, but it's, yeah, it's, it's hard to, to read what I'm feeling. Right. You know? So, you talk about in social situations, it's almost like a, you call it awkward, but in, in weightlifting, um, like what is your internal dialogue like? Because it can't be concerned about what other people are thinking. What, what, is that, what does that dialogue sound like? Was there any kind of self-doubt going on? What were you like as an athlete in that, in that way? Yeah, internal dialogue is very important to me. And in, in actually when I was developing the, the advanced course that you were talking about, um, and as many years leading up to that as I was developing as a coach and learning how to explain things to people I read something that was talking about that internal dialogue so I came up with a concept uh, that I started teaching and trying to describe to people as the athlete ID so the athlete internal dialogue athlete ID also means for me as a coach is how I identify them meaning I know what things that we're working on with that athlete I know the cues that they're currently using uh, that are in their head. And, uh, so for me, um, I mean, obviously it wasn't always like this and as an athlete, but what I learned along the way is that the more that I could, um, not for me, visualization was, wasn't that good. It wasn't good for me because Mm -hmm. when I did it, I overdid it. And so it took away again, it took away energy from energy from me. And so what I tried to do is just kind of keep my mind, um, empty or keep it free uh, and not dwell on um, 
focus on what needs to be done or try to add extra motivation like by watching motivational movies and or inspiring movies and stuff like that and so the more i could kind of stay outside of that because i don't need that extra stuff i already have uh, so much internal motivation that i don't need any extra i don't need i know how to lift i do the lift over and over and over again in the gym um you know basically almost daily and so the way that i would bring my back myself back is in my head i would repeat just a couple times those two or three cues that I needed at that time that I felt like I needed at that time to best execute the lift. Mm -hmm. And so that uh, kept my mind off of the end result uh, because when your mind heads towards that end result or uh, say in weightlifting when you have three attempts, if I'm on my first attempt and I'm already thinking about what I'm going to take on my third attempt, you're probably going to miss the weight. So my internal dialogue was very much just focusing on those few things that I needed to best execute the lift. For example, um, not not just thinking them, but feeling them once I grab the bar, feeling those things that I'm thinking. So for example, the first one is just locking my back in, which is you know, um, probably the biggest thing that I see people miss these days, especially in the, in the fitness community that we're in, when you get used to moving Um, and breathing hard at the same time you start to miss that and it starts to carry over into your heavy lifts little side note there Uh, but for me that very first thing was just locking my back in um, as with as much aggression as I could and then feeling that from the floor and then moving on to my next couple focal points Mm -hmm. Uh, so my internal dialogue was very much just keeping my mind there and to me that created a shield of any negative thoughts coming in any outside distractions coming in and me thinking ahead. Right. So it sounds like what you're saying is you learned how to be present, right? You're you're not letting the past, your past lifts or experiences influence you or the fear of what's coming in the future. Where do you think you learned that? Because that's not something I think innate in all people, but it's something that I see in, in almost all elite athletes. Yeah, definitely being present and in the moment. And I think if you're uh, if you're an athlete that's one of the best of the best, you know that. You mm-hmm. have figured it out in some way. I think there are some athletes, Some I would probably say they're mostly younger athletes that are just very talented at competing and very tough that are getting away with doing really well without that skill. I, I always call it a skill that, uh, that needs to be practiced and developed over time, and that's the way that I teach it. But um, I will tell you that that came a little later in my career, that skill that I really feel like I – uh, learned and got better and better and better at, and I'm still getting better at it to this day. But, uh, when I first started, I don't remember how, sorry, how many years it was, but, um, when I look back on that time, I wasn't really focusing. I was just naturally good at competing. I was a naturally good competitor. Um, I was, um, tough enough to make lifts that maybe I shouldn't have been making or to try, try weights that maybe I shouldn't have been, shouldn't have been trying. But I went through years of competing and did really well and got really, really good without much focus in my head, just lifting the weight. And then, um, you know, like any athlete, you have struggles through your career. And I had a, a couple uh, a couple hits where I had a, a bad competition here and there, and they were big competitions. And it really uh, knocked me backwards mentally, uh, knocked my confidence down, and I kind of... I say I kind of forgot how to compete, so I lost that natural ability that I had. And so through years, I had to relearn how to compete and to compete in a little bit of a different way. And so that's when it came to filling my head with those focal points and um, actually feeling them with my body uh, as I'm moving through the lift. And I found that as I got more aware of that's what I was doing, I started perfecting it. And that's um, when my uh, my execution and my ability to compete, I would say, was better than ever. Mm-hmm. Um, so now it's not just a natural ability that I have, but it's a skill. And so now with that skill, I can I may may be at a competition or I may have a day in the gym where I'm not confident, I'm not feeling good, but because I have that skill of focusing, um, I usually still make those lifts. And in fact, I tell people all the time, you know, there, there's that. That, that saying that, that goes, uh, you have to believe if you want to achieve. Well, yeah, that's all good. Believe and, and have confidence and have faith in yourself and everything else. 
but I want you to be so good at focusing. I want you to be so skilled at that concept that you can achieve whether you believe or not. So it's, uh, it's kind of maybe a hard concept for uh, people to wrap their mind around, and I'm not definitely not trying to be negative or anything like that, but I want you to be so skilled that you can make those lifts that you mm-hmm. don't believe you can. Like I was in, uh, in the gym just the other day, and I'd just done, um, I think it was 15.4, the uh, handstand push-ups mm-hmm. and power cleans. And so that was one, the, our programming uh, for that day for the 40th class I was telling you about, the strength bias class. So we warmed up and we did that first and then we rested seven minutes and we had 15 minutes to build to uh, a heavy snatch for the day. I, um, at that seven minute mark, I started warming up and I missed 135 pounds three times. I was just, you know, that from doing all those handstand pushups and definitely just, you know, tired and not feeling it. And I just kept going and um, I did uh, 245 and then um, felt terrible and heavy uh but i had like a minute left and so i put 265 on the bars like i'll just give it a shot i don't really feel like doing this i don't i'm probably not gonna make it but those things going in my mind so uh yeah by the time i stepped up to the bar i had those few focal points in my mind and i executed them to the best of my ability and i make the lift um and that happens over and over again with me as i get older i'm an old master lifter now just turned 37 um as you get older, I, or as I, I've gotten older, I'm getting more lazy. But what's uh, what's saving me is that ability ability to focus. So mm-hmm. I don't have to dwell on the workout that I'm about to do. I don't have to dwell on um, uh, a heavy lift. I can leave it shut down and then turn it on with a snap of a finger and execute. I love it, man. I definitely want to get back into this a little bit more when we start talking about coaching. Um, but one thing you mentioned was uh, this idea of believing. And so I'm curious, I, I think there's a misconception that, you know, as a, as a young kid, if you want to become an Olympian, then you have to believe you're, you are capable of becoming, becoming an Olympian at a really young age. And I think that's such a, a huge leap for a lot of people to make. And I also don't think that's actually true. I'm curious for you, was there a moment that you can remember or an experience in which you remember thinking, I can actually become an Olympian? Yeah, absolutely. That's a good question. And, and I'm, I'm absolutely with you on that as well, because if you feed that into a young kid's head and they're like, well, okay, I'll say that I believe, but do I really believe? Probably not. You know, most people probably don't. So you just have, but you have to be able to attack it and go after that goal anyway. And really the best way to go after that goal, if it is a goal of yours, is just to try to be the best that you can be. And so when I first started, I had, you know, a a really good coach that was, that was telling me these things that he felt I was capable of. And I don't know that he necessarily said Olympics for a while, but, you know, he said, you can do really well. And, um, he kept pushing me and he kept saying those things to me and that was encouraging to me but he wasn't overwhelming with it and when I spent the first two years of training and weightlifting under my parents carport um did I think I was going to go to the Olympics no not really that really wasn't it was in the back of my mind it really wasn't even uh, a goal at that point and it wasn't a reality until uh, about five years later, so I started training and weightlifting specifically in 98, and then in um, mid-2003, um, a ranking list came out, and I was uh, overall number three on the ranking list, and that's not through just my weight class. I was had been number one in my weight class for a while, but number three overall, and, and you know, typically our teams had been, you know, three to four people, and so seeing that, it you know, finally clicked into my mind, wait a minute, you can actually make the Olympic team. Um, so it was definitely an exciting day and probably a day that I'll remember forever sitting there with my family and looking at that ranking list and just the realization of I can actually do this. But I'll tell you what happened after that is I started to struggle a little bit. Interesting. That's one of Very those, interesting. The, one, one of those competitions that I had that 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 um that i didn't didn't do well at at world championships and um you know knocked my confidence down and stuff like that so you know every person is different every athlete's a little bit different in that regard but you know i think if we can find a way to um to figure out um you know how they best work mentally and and help them 
uh, through that in that way. But but the biggest thing is is uh, you know really I guess keeping the pressure off. I mean uh, it's hard to say because I'm very much in competition. I'm very much a pressure lifter, um, especially when I'm um, when I when I have that confidence and when I have that ability. Uh, to focus but Me- meaning you you like the pressure I, it, it brings a new level out of you yeah I like the pressure I like saying okay this is my last attempt I have to make this lift to win the competition mm-hmm. um, I, I like that that's 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 why you compete right that's yep. what you want I want to be I think whereas a lot of people they don't want to be in that situation just let me go ahead and win it on my first attempt I feel better about that no I want to win it on my last attempt where where it matters I want to be in that situation but at the same time, if you're putting pressure on yourself every single day in the gym leading up to that competition and you're feeling that level of, of pressure that's, uh, you know, unhealthy and negative, then we've got to find a, a balance there. What would you consider one of or your most defining moment in your career? So something that you look back and, um, you know, it, it affected you the most in, in a lasting way that you still have with you today. Uh, I mean, when you say that, the, the first thing that came to mind, and actually somebody asked me a similar question not too long ago, and it's the first thing that came to my mind as well, is kind of just the realization of, of what this concept of uh, focusing and mindset has done for me. Um, in, so I made the Olympics in 2004 and 2008. Um, in 2009, uh, we had our daughter, and so... After the Olympics in 2008, I had taken like six months out of the gym, which was the first time I'd been out of the gym for more than two two days at a time for, well, more than 10 years. And so I brought myself back with, um, you know, something we can talk about later, but a a very low volume. I brought myself back to about 95% through the course of about a year or so. But by the time I got back around to 2011, um, I was doing really well, and we, I went to the national comp, uh, national championships, and uh, and won that 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 year. But at the age of 31, I was able to do uh, uh, it was a one kilo PR on my total, which was to me it was really big. Um, but I was doing really really well. I was I was uh, wasn't as strong as I'd ever been, but I was better than I'd ever been, uh, focus wise and technique wise and everything else. I, I, I want to say real quick, just call out weightlifters. Y'all are some sick puppies man working for years for a one kilo pr i'm a typical crossfitter if i don't pr in the gym almost every time i'm pissed yeah absolutely i mean it's easy to to give into that and say if you stop improving or even you start to go backwards a little bit it's really hard to Mm -hmm. to find a way to to bring yourself back and to fight for you know like you said that one kilo pr but you know really that to me that wasn't the ultimate goal my my ultimate goal with it all was just to be the best that i could be especially at that point in my career and to you know if i can add another national championship to 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 the list there then then awesome but uh after that we went to the um uh yeah it was the year of the pan american games again and uh i did really well there as well i went five for six and i was able to get a, a bronze medal on on the my third clean and jerk i was in the situation to um to win so we, i went from okay do we want to go for silver do we want to go for gold we decided to go for the gold it was a big jump in weight it would have been an american record i wasn't able to make it on that day but did really really well there we were going to the um uh, world championships maybe a month and a half later or a month maybe maybe it was only a month it was pretty quick pretty quickly after but um as soon as i got home um i was started feeling really sick so i had caught something um in the location that we were at at that competition and um man i just didn't feel right it was a really really weird uh sickness i guess that that i'd never felt before and um don't even remember what it was but it definitely uh kept me out of training like i normally would have and so i had to really recover from that and just uh go in and do what i could in the gym and um and i never felt uh like myself and even to the point to where I, I traveled to the the world championships that year and um i remember like a couple of days before uh, at this time i I'd, I'd just done 150 kilo snatch at the national championships i'd done somewhere around 150 at the at the pan-american games 
and uh, I'm in there a couple of days before trying to do 120. It just felt like death. Wow. You know, so 80 and 80 percent lift, and I'm thinking, well, I don't, I don't know how this is going to go down. Um, so I was really struggling, and uh, obviously struggling mentally a little bit, and uh, uh, going into the day of competition, same thing. Started warming up, and the weights just, I don't ever remember them feeling heavier from the floor um ultimately uh i was able to make two of my snatches um i think i did i don't remember what the weight was but uh made two of my snatches and no wait made one of my snatches missed my first attempt made my second one missed my third one and a little bit of a hole in the world championships championships understand that you know we're not fighting for our, just ourselves we're fighting for the team this was 2011 the year before the olympics we were trying to get slots uh for the olympic team so just to give people context the the better the entire team does the more that a country the more people a country can send yeah and, and yeah typically we're kind of at the bottom of the list or not even on the list mm -hmm. at all so we have to figure out how to get a spot from there but uh Again, you know, the weights were, were really heavy on the clean and jerk as well. Ultimately, I was able to make my first two clean and jerk attempts, went up to a, a heavier one on my third to try to uh, inch up above a couple other uh, lifters. And um, I just remember that second clean and jerk attempt that I made, it was to, to get a 325 kilo total. And a 325 kilo total at any world championships will place pretty well. It will give you some good points. So it was a big lift for me to be able to make on that day. And after all was said and done, I ended up getting more points than anyone else on the team. Wow. And through the, the two years combined, I, was, I got more points uh, than, anyone, than anyone else did during that quad that was uh, meant for those spots on the Olympics. And so it's probably my proudest moment because I was able to use – I, the focus that I was talking about, I was able to put that outside of my head in the moment. And now it didn't work in the snatch, you know, but I was able to find myself um, back and, uh, and be able to pull out the 325 kilo total that was very important for the team. Um, so that's probably my, my biggest moment. I love that, man. Have you ever heard the expression, amateurs wait for motivation, professionals do it with a headache? Right. So yeah, you're, I mean, sa same type of thing. You don't need to feel your best to do your best, right? Because you're able to focus and access everything that you're capable of in that given moment. Absolutely. It's probably, I mean, the, maybe one of the only times that I can say, I think I did pull everything out of right. my body. I could have, <laughs> right. I could have on that day. Yeah. That's awesome. What was it like transitioning for you uh, from an athlete to, or, you know, a professional and elite athlete to a non-athlete or just a, a coach? Because I know for me, you know, I had not even nearly the career you had and, f and it was still a very, I had to stop suddenly because of a back surgery and it was, um, it was very challenging for me emotionally and, and in terms of my identity. So I'm curious how it was for you. Yeah, initially it was it was very exciting to me. Um, uh, ident Identity-wise, it was kind of a slow, it has been a very slow process because I, I wasn't just knocked out of the game immediately. When I started coaching, I was still competing at a high level and it kind of slowly faded or is still kind of slowly, mm -hmm. slowly fading away as, as an athlete. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, there wasn't, um, you know, I could have coached weightlifting, but I remember, you know, a couple of people mentioned it to me, well, you, you know, why don't you start trying to coach a little bit or, or whatever, work at a gym. And I was like, absolutely. I want no part of it. And then, um, you know, I got, to, got to know what CrossFit was all about and definitely, you know, the people that CrossFit attracted pulled me into the community and just loved it. I uh, still love CrossFit, still love the CrossFit community. But, um, you know, because of CrossFit, I came in and started coaching um, had no idea what type of coach I was going to be, if I was going to know how to coach, if I was going to be good at it, but I felt very comfortable from, from the beginning and, um, uh, just kept going from there. But, you know, up to this point, um, we fast forward, I think I started doing that in early 2010. Um, you know, up to this point, I've probably been struggling for the last couple years with coaching, uh, just because, 
I still have a hard time understanding, um, I guess, the lack of personal responsibility that, I mean, really, I guess most people have. I mean, mm -hmm. we all have it to an extent on different things. I have a lot of lack of personal responsibility on a lot, lot of other things. But when it comes to being an athlete and saying that I have these goals and I want to be capable of this, and then so for me as a coach, if I give you a, a mobility drill to do in class and we're working on it and we're making a difference and you don't take it upon yourself to do it on your own outside of the gym, you know, even with me explaining that to you and giving you those directions, then it's very frustrating to me. It's, it's, it's been so hard for me to, to wrap my mind around that. Now, there are those people that do. There are those people that dig in and give everything that they have. Um, but I think that's maybe one reason why I enjoy speaking and commentating and stuff like that so much because I can share um, information. I can, I can um, uh, talk to people and they can choose to use it or not, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I don't, I don't see it. I don't know. You know, I very much want to help people. I'm very driven to help people. Coaching is absolutely a way that you can do that and a way that you can make um, a big, big difference, but it's definitely a, a, a part of coaching that I struggle with. And just the whole, um, um, a part, a part of being a good coach is being a good, uh, supporter and motivator. And mm -hmm. I'm, you know, I'm not that good at that. Like I, as a coach, I've been working on it for years and it's just not natural to me mm -hmm. because uh, I think because I trained by myself most of the time through my career, uh, for most of my career, I wrote my own programming. So I was very independent, very self-motivated. And I just, I just don't feel if you don't have a certain amount of that inside of yourself, then I don't know that you're going to be the best that you can possibly be. So, you know, finding a way to teach people that, I don't know, can you really teach it? Maybe a little bit of it, a little bit of it I'm not sure. Right. I, personally, I think that one of the biggest problems is that people just don't understand what it takes. Like they literally have no idea how hard you work to get where you are. Right. They think that they're doing everything possible, but there's just some things that they don't know. They don't know. Right. They, they, they don't understand. Uh, they just have blind spots. Right. A D and I talk about this all the time. Rather, she talks about this all the time in terms of people trying to reach body composition goals. They say, you know, I want to be 6% body fat um, in this amount of time, yet their behaviors don't line up with that, right? They're, they're going to a ton of social events, putting themselves in, you know, less than optimal positions to succeed. And they're doing that over and over and over and over. And they're, you know, they come running, complaining, why am I not reaching my goals? Well, it's because you're not setting yourself up correctly. Um, and then she explains like, you, you want to know how Katrin does it, right? When, when she travels, she has every single meal planned out ahead of time in a little piece of Tupperware so that she doesn't, uh, she doesn't, she has less risk of mistakes. You know what I mean? Um, what, what do you think contributes to, or not what contributes? How do you, how do you think being an athlete, being a high level athlete has contributed to your being a good coach or, or how has it challenged you? So one, you know, one thing I, I see often is elite athletes have a hard time because it's so, you have to be so selfish in a way as an athlete, they have a hard time becoming selfless and really giving themselves to what their athletes need. And so I'm, not, I'm just using that as mm -hmm. an example. Sure. So how has it affected you? Yeah, I think it's definitely held me back as a coach and just what we were talking about because I'm 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 not the unfortunately I'm not the coach to go be excited and to, to give a high five to where that is very necessary in so many situations. And so and still even to this day, like I when somebody calls me a coach, I feel weird about it. I just don't I just never really felt like a coach, but I think that's a that's a big part of it is being uh, that elite athlete and that self-motivated athlete has held me back a lot as an overall coach. Mm -hmm. um, as the teaching part of it, I'm very comfortable with. I, I love teaching. I love being up in front of a group and talking about weightlifting and sharing my experiences and, and trying to teach them something. And so where that came from, I, I'm not sure. <laughs> I mean, I don't think that came from um, from from uh, being an athlete, mm -hmm. but the knowledge that I gained from being an athlete 
I'm able to share that. And, um, you know, I obviously learned from, you know, a handful of very good coaches, very good athletes that were mentors that taught me um, most of what I know about weightlifting. And then also because I was in the gym by myself um, all those years, I learned a lot from myself. I've learned a lot the past seven years as a coach from other people. And, you know, I get to share that uh, as a teacher. Um, to kind of add to that a little bit, um, for so long, um, even before I made the Olympics in 2004, I felt very, very led to share my story and to speak, to be a speaker and to, to inspire people, um, you know, through that, um, through that avenue. Um, but at that time I was like, I, I want to speak, but I felt like my tongue was tied. Literally it was tied. Like there's no way I'm ever going to be able to get up in front of a couple people and say anything a little, you know, a little this, fear on this podcast. Yeah. So yeah. I just, I didn't see how it was ever going to happen. In fact, um, in my first year of college, uh, speech was a, a requirement. Uh, I found a loophole that I could take Spanish <laughs> instead yeah. of speech. And so I did. And so that's wow. the only reason I took Spanish, but I ended up taking Spanish for three or four semesters and it helped me as I was traveling and weightlifting. But, um, I, got away from that speech class as quickly as I could as soon wow. as I figured out that but um, you know what I'm getting at is that coaching gave me that voice it gave me that confidence to get up in, pr- in front of people when we first started doing when I first started doing seminars it was with my wife Jody and with uh, Urs- Ursula her coach if, if you guys don't know who mm-hmm. Ursula is um, look her up you'll know who she is really yep. quick but she's in the weightlifting community she's she does so much for the weightlifting community she's a great coach and one that I've learned a significant amount from and especially in regards to being up in front of people in in uh, running a seminar because she would lead the seminar she would talk in those first couple it was Jody and I demoing as she would talk we'd do a lift and build up to a heavy lift kind of a pretty cool uh, setting I wish I could go back to that so I don't have to talk all the time right. but you know I would say nothing and then slowly people would ask a question and I would be up in front of the group and I would say something and then it turned into me you know what, I'm saying these same things over and over again. I'm going to write it up on the board, and I'm going to give uh, uh, a, a, right. a speech. Um, and then so I slowly developed my own seminar, and I started doing my own seminars, and eventually was able to develop the, the advanced course. Um, so that gave me that confidence to get up in front of people and to lead into now what I believe that um, I'm supposed to be doing is up in front of people speaking and sharing my story so love it man yeah it's like anything else um speaking and presenting is a skill like everything else right you just have to walk through that fear and right on the other side of that is like a huge like burst of energy you know what i mean absolutely what so you you've you spent 10 plus years in the weightlifting community only and then now you've had the chance to work with thousands of crossfit athletes what do you think are the biggest differences in training a weightlifter in weightlifting and a crossfitter in weightlifting yeah i was just talking about this the other day i i learned fairly quickly as a coach in this community one that if i'm going to help someone in the lifts the best that I possibly can in this community, I need to know more about all the other movements that they're doing Um, because I need to know if they're doing them in a way that they're supposed to be doing them, which is going to help what we're trying to accomplish in weightlifting, or are they doing them in a way that's taken away? And I think most people um, still to this day are doing something at least in one of their movements that's negatively affecting uh, their movement or their overall performance in the lifts and so can you give me a specific example of that um yeah a push-up if you're if you're doing your push-ups all the time with your hands wide and your elbows flaring out then i guarantee you struggle in the overhead position Mm -hmm. you have you know more internal rotation some coaches like internal rotation overhead so whether that's right or wrong i'm not going to debate that but i'm saying that for the position that i'm trying to teach and get you into to, to in my mind, try to keep you healthier and, and have a stronger overhead position, you're lending to that lacking ability to create the position that I want overhead. So, right. yeah, just one of many, uh, many examples. On the rower, if your knees are touching, 
um, every single rep that you do, then right. you're going to struggle to squat the way that I want you to. So there's so many things that people do on, on the rower, on the pull-up bar, and everything that we do in CrossFit that, that can negatively affect them. But again, if they change that, it can positively affect it. But um, I realized somewhere along the way that us weightlifting coaches – uh, the new weightlifting coach is a different kind of weightlifting coach than there's ever been because most all weightlifting coaches are now coaching in the CrossFit community. The way weightlifting coaches work before and weightlifting athletes is that, you know, most of them saw their athletes on a daily basis um, or most of the time. So they saw most of the reps that they did and they were only on a weightlifting program. They knew everything else that was going on. They had more control over what was happening Mm -hmm. um in this community the way that you know i've done most of my coaching um in weekly weekly weightlifting classes is i see the athlete once a week and they're not doing just weightlifting they're doing a lot of other things that are causing us you know most people uh most situations with most people to spin their wheels Mm -hmm. um so you know figuring out a way around that you know again for me learning more about all the other movements uh getting as much knowledge uh, as i can there so i can best help them in weightlifting what are some of the other like biggest problems you see in terms of um non-weightlifting movements affecting people's weightlifting performance. I know, I, I know you've talked a lot about um, handstand holds and handstand push-ups and stuff like that. What are some of the biggest, like, most problematic ones that you see? I can, uh, yeah, I mean, there are definitely a lot of examples I can give. I think a good general one is just anytime you're muscling any movement, it's going to lead to you muscling the Olympic lifts as well. So if you're bending your arms early on the muscle-ups, um, if you're doing pull-ups and this is your bottom position instead mm-hmm. of you getting all the way down, if on your handstand push-ups your hands are always um, wide and, and turned out um, and you're just repping away, not locking out all the way, that's going to you know, contribute to your lacking ability um, to do the same thing there. Because you're not, on both of those examples, you're not challenging that full range of motion. Like the weight lifts are going to demand you, you bring, you know, you reach, right? Absolutely. You're going to have to get full range of motion. And if you're not, you're, you're going to limit yourself quite a bit. Mm -hmm. There's no way you can, you know, muscle a certain amount of weight. You know, at some point it's got to be, um, more fluid and you've got to use a combination of your whole body as opposed to isolating a few parts of your body by muscling. Yeah. What are the biggest mistakes you see people making trying to build strength? And namely that, you know, there's this idea that, um, we have to stay in great shape for the open all year long, right? People are very afraid of letting their conditioning dip for a little while. And so in the past I have, I've tried to completely cater to that. Um, or, or one of two things, completely cater to that and let them keep 100% of their conditioning or say, no, you have to do it my way. We're just going to lift for, you know, three to four months and then we're going to get it back. How do you, how do you go about that? Yeah, man, that's a tough line. I, I hear you on that. And I've been, you know, in the, in the same situation where I've gone, okay, let's just have fun. And then, uh, or let maybe not have fun is not the right word, but you know, let's do what you think you need to do, or let's do what I feel strongly that we need to do. And that line is, is, is very tough. And, you know, that's kind of going back to what I was talking about before is like, I'm going to tell you what I feel like you need to do. And I'm going to give you the information that I have and it's up to you to apply it, you know, mm-hmm. cause again, we don't have control of our athletes all the time. But, um, I think there's a couple things that, that come to mind for me. And one of them is, um, you know, athletes skipping steps. And the second one is, uh, excess volume um we actually just did a podcast on uh, excess volume um not too long ago but uh, skipping steps meaning that if you don't have the mobility to do uh, a good quality full range of motion squat but you're doing heavy snatches and clean and jerks over and over and over again all the time uh, or you're continuing to squat to that partial range of motion you're going to absolutely limit your overall potential um if you're uh you know, any movement, if you're doing any movement before you have sufficient mobility to do it, mm-hmm. I believe that you're limiting your overall potential and your o- overall um, strength 
the strength that you could have. Right. Um, man, there's so many examples that we can sit here and talk about and give on skipping steps. But, you know, at uh, for Power Monkey Camp and Power Monkey Fitness in general, you know, <laughs> working with uh, my good friend Dave Durante and all the other Power Monkey coaches, all of us are so much on board with that concept of trying to teach people and preach to people let's don't skip steps let's don't be afraid to take 10 steps back if you need to to slowly build back up and move forward to get not just a one step beyond where you are but many steps beyond where you are and the the fact that that's for many people it's going to take years to have the patience to do that it's i'm so glad you said that i was about to ask you if you had talked to Dave about that, because that's a, that's a conversation that I have with Nick, our gymnast, all the time, right? Because we don't let people progress past a certain level in gymnastics before they can do a certain mobility exercise, which for most CrossFitters is, uh, that is the most painful thing they'll ever do is hold themselves back. I'm curious, how do you, how do you go about um, I don't know. I don't know if the right word is motivating, but um, convincing people of of that fact that they need to do this. Yeah, I've gotten to the point to where I don't do a lot of convincing anymore. Yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. to be honest with you, I, you know, I I give my opinion, and I give the information, I give everything that I have a couple times, mm-hmm. and then if at that point they're not listening or they're not, you know, taking my recommendations, then you know that's on them like they've got to if they've got to really really want to change before I can help them any further than that so that's kind of again where you know where I'm at as a coach for example if if I if I tell you um I want you to warm up without your shoes on so that's one thing that I do a lot I have everybody warm up without their shoes on we do squat sequences and mobility without shoes on and then we can put our shoes on and go from there if I ever see you in the gym not wearing your shoes man, I'm, I'm on the edge of being done with you. You know, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying? Like, cause that's such a simple thing that I ask you to do that. I explained in detail why I want you to do it. And you're still, you know, you're still not doing it. Right. Um, you know, just again, one, one of many examples, but yeah, absolutely. Dave, absolutely on board with that. Um, it's what, you know, him and I've been working together for, uh, what, four, five years now. And it's, what we talk about with every single mm-hmm. type of group that we work with and it's what we what's what we preach and what we teach um not only are we talking about that concept but we're trying to deliver to them the proper steps to take right yeah i explain it to some people i say you know you might be able to do more muscle ups we might be able to take you from 15 to 20 by just having you do more muscle ups or do weighted muscle ups but you may be actually capable of doing 30 in a row if you learn how, if you take a few steps back and learn how to do it correctly and build the proper fundamentals. And when, when we explain it like that, um, we get a little bit more buy-in, but it just takes humility, plain and simple. It takes the humility to take steps back and look at it, you know, look at what the elite people are actually doing in other sports. Um, I think CrossFit is still so young that we really still don't know what people are capable of, Mm -hmm. right? If, if these elite athletes take a step back in all of these different areas, what are they capable of in all of them? And so I think we're going to see that in the years to come. Yeah, no doubt. One thing that I say all the time, kind of along with what you were saying is that I believe that a conservative estimation of 95% of the people in this community could completely redo their push up slash handstand and their squat. And if they did, everything else would fall into line because you've got to have really good overhead mobility to do a good handstand hold. Mm-hmm. Um, you've got to have a really good, um, uh, or you got to have really good overall mobility to do a really high quality full range of motion squat. That's what Dave and I talk about all the time. And in certain groups, he'll do a handstand assessment and I'll do a squat assessment. And in that way they get a complete, a full, a full complete assessment. And, you know, we try to leave them with one or two things that they can work on not everything that they can work on, but one or two things they can work on to best make that change. One other thing I wanted to mention is, is what I really, really like about all the dumbbells in the regionals specifically, not the open too, but in the regionals is when now a lot of people are trying those workouts and they're like, wait a minute, I can't hold this dumbbell over my head. Oh yeah, I do need to work on mobility, Mm -hmm. you know, where they can get away with it with, 
you know, more you, you can more so get away with it with the barbell because you can compensate and, right. and, you know, rotate forward and, you know, push back and all that stuff. And if you don't have a certain amount of mobility, you're not going to be able to do those dumbbell movements that they're that they're trying to incorporate. Uh, another thing, too, is on the uh, on, on the ring dips. I, I think, uh, you know, um, some people were saying the standards might have been a little bit more strict in regards to maybe getting a little bit lower. Mm -hmm. Dave's been preaching that for years. Don't train to a stand. Don't, yeah, don't train to a standard train that full range of motion, right. you know, train the best possible movement. And, um, you know, to me that partial range of motion that people are probably always doing on ring dips could have potentially contributed to all the, um, the injuries that we right. saw. So your number two, uh, common mistake was excess volume. You want to talk about that? Yeah, I think that it's just easy. One of the things that I find is that, and, and I'm guilty of this too as an athlete, the people that are attracted to this community, almost all of them, it's easy to work hard. That's not the issue. Right. It's, if, if, if I tell you as the coach, if I say, I want you to come in and do this open wide or a open wide every single day, mm -hmm. you know, they would do it and they would love it. Yep. You know? The hard part is finding that level, finding that, that, that level of volume that's going to optimize your, uh, your um, progress. Yeah. yeah, your progress and everything else. And I think for most people in this community at this point, especially those that are, that are interested in competing at whatever level and they're trying to be the best that they can be, I think most of them are doing too much. Now, it's hard for me to say that because I went through a long period of my career where I did a, an extreme amount of volume and I benefited from it. But at some point there was, there was a turning point there that I didn't pay attention to enough. And so I kept trying to do the same amount or maybe a little bit less, but somewhere around the same amount. And I was usually just kind of working myself backwards a little bit. And I told you in 2011, I was finally able to get that one kilo PR mm -hmm. after, I mean, this was after many, many years. I mean, a lot of years, seven years maybe. Um, but through those seven years, I still did well. I competed well, but I never progressed. I was just staying the same or a little bit less. And if I would have done less sooner, I would have been better off. So there's, there, there's a line there to where, okay, I benefited in my later years from doing less volume, but it was because I did more volume before. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't mean that someone can go out there and say, okay, I'm going to do a lot of volume now so I can benefit from this later. No, you've got to build up to that volume first. And that's where I think a lot of people are missing. They're doing a certain amount of volume, and but again, skipping that step before they're really ready to do it. You know, right. did, you, did you do uh, six months of a three-day-a-week program before you jumped into the six-day-a-week program? Right. You know, no. And if you haven't, especially if you're an athlete that's getting into the CrossFit community, maybe you've, maybe you've been uh, that CrossFit athlete. Uh, athlete or that weightlifting athlete that's been doing it for um you know one or two years and you didn't have that much of an athletic background man you need to spend a couple years three or four days a week yep. and building that capacity making sure again another part of that is making sure that you're moving correctly and and taking the the slow route if you really want to be the best that you can be that slow route that patient route is is best you're not gonna you know you don't have to come in and kill yourself every day. Right. How, how does this sit with you? I usually tell people, you know, you increase volume when you stop progressing, right? Do the least amount possible as long as you're progressing. And then if you, that stops, then you can think about increasing volume. That's absolutely, I love that. And, and in fact, it's usually the other way around though, right? Like you do mm -hmm. so much and you're not progressing. So you think you have to add more. Right. Well, think about doing less first and like you said if, if you're if you're an athlete out there that's struggling with progress or say if you're in pain all the time you're injured all the time and for whatever reason you're just not progressing progressing the way that you think start thinking in terms of backing up mm -hmm. you know go down all the way to and I, I know it'd be hard for people to do but three days a week mm -hmm. if you need to just be in the gym then do some light unintensive rowing or mobility which you probably need to be doing anyway on those other days to to see where you're at. What is this three day a week or four day a week program doing for me? What is this volume doing for me? And then go from there. Like you said, if that's, if you're progressing with that, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Right. Like you said, if you stop progressing, then maybe we can start, uh, 
adding a little bit and going from there. Another note real quick on that is that too many people, too many athletes out there, I just had a conversation about a high-level uh, weightlifting athlete um, the other day, but if you're always in pain, I it really bothers me when I hear athletes or coaches saying, well, pain is just part of the game. Maybe a certain extent, but if you're in pain on a daily basis when you're training, especially if outside of the gym if you're in pain, I don't believe it has to be that way. That is your body giving you an idea of the level of volume that you should be doing. Mm -hmm. If you're in pain all the time, it's probably a combination of, one, it could just be volume, uh, or it could be incorrect movement as well, uh, or mobility issues that you have. But, you know, that's your body telling you you need to do something different, and that something different is not more. Mm -hmm. yeah. What do you think when people tell you, I'm going to, I'm going to spend, you know, this entire year just doing powerlifting so I can get my squats, uh, where they need to be for weightlifting. And then I'll get back into weightlifting. And if what their ultimate goal is, is to actually compete in weightlifting or, or increase their weightlifting in general. You know, I, I, I guess I would say that I, I don't know. I don't know that I've ever seen anyone do that and be successful. So I don't know if, uh, is it a bad idea? I'm all up for experimentation. And to mm -hmm. me, that's what it would be. Um, I think I would be more along the lines of, okay, let's, let's do more or let's do less Olympic lifting and more strength work. Yes. But let's don't take them out completely because we can spend that time doing light technique work in some sort of way that will help you maintain your move or will improve your movement while you're trying to improve your strength at the same time. What do you think is something that you do as a coach that significantly um, contributes to your athlete's success that others aren't doing? Oh, yeah, that's tough. That's tough. <laughs> um, man, it's hard to say because there, what, what I've learned along the way is that there are so many good coaches out there. Like I think as a coach, uh, especially when I first came in and I started to realize, hey, I can – do this pretty well I think I'm I think I'm doing a pretty good job I started to get competitive I'm starting mm -hmm. to be like now I'm competitive with other coaches right, I want to be right. better than you as a coach yep. and that's just not that shouldn't be the case you know we're all we're all trying to help people and and make change and, and do everything else so what I've learned and accepted along the way is there's a lot of really good coaches out there um, but one of the, the the thing that I really focus on with people are is the making sure that they're um, on the step where they need to be you know giving that information uh, you know giving them a, c a complete mobility assessment uh, making sure that that they're doing the mobility that they need to be doing when they're in class with me if they struggle with positions or mobility then we're doing mobility between sets in some sort of way and that's not you know static holds or uh, or anything like that but just some something to help them get into a better position or a drill between sets to help them perform the movement better so I do I'm very very heavy with that stuff um, I don't know how many other coaches are out there doing that but I think that that's something that I've seen um, over and over and over again big benefit in um, another thing is trying to teach them the concept of focus like mm -hmm, I talked about mm -hmm. before I know I've talked about that too much no, already but, yeah get into but, I would love to hear how you how you actually coach that to people yeah so the first thing that I do is I go over it with them and I have a write-up that I send them um, if they're a new athlete I say I want you to read this and it talks about the the concept of um, one of the things that I've called it through the years is simplified focus um, I've also called it the three Q rule so I'm not going to give you more than three cues, but I'm not going to give you less than that either because that number I feel is what's going to allow you to execute the most. So making sure that they understand the concept because that's now going to become our language. Right. And that means that they know that I'm always looking at these three areas in their movement and that I'm always cueing them on those three areas. And they know that they should be, their awareness should be on those three areas. So that just developing that um that language with the athlete, I think, has been very big as well. And I don't know that there's a lot of coaches. That, I mean, I don't know how many coaches are out there doing that either. It doesn't have to be my language, but I think developing some sort of game plan like that, some sort right. of language with your athlete so they understand what you as the coach are looking for, I think they can better do what you want them to do. 
and how how do they respond to that sort of thing? Have you what's been maybe you know uh, uh, one or two athletes that you've had a big impact on their mindset in that way? Well, one mm-hmm. a lot of a lot of athletes struggle with it um, because a lot of athletes are very um, uh, thinking too much, so their mind is always scrambled. So it's hard to bring them back down to three things. Um, a lot of other athletes they struggle because they don't ever think anything, mm-hmm. or they're just thinking if they're going to snatch. They just program snatch into their mind and they go um, pick it up. So it's hard for them to focus on anything. So it's a matter of, okay, we've got to teach you how to do this with partial movements. So I'm going to teach you how to focus on extension by putting you in a high hang position. I'm going to teach you how to focus on staying tight from the floor and getting to a good position at the knee by doing liftoffs, just going from the floor to the knee. So definitely, you know, Again, it's a skill. It's a skill that for a lot of people takes a lot of time to develop. But I've seen, um, you know, athletes in weightlifting competition put it into play. And it's awesome. It's awesome to watch it. And and absolutely, when they're in the middle of that competition and I'm reminding them, hey, be be in the moment, be Mm -hmm. aware. Um, I say I tell them to keep your uh, keep your awareness with the bar. And that means. When you're at the floor, you're focused on being tight. When the bar is at the level of the knee, you're feeling the bar close to the body, for example. When you're extending, you're feeling that extension. So that means that I know their awareness is with the bar, and then they're able to execute the movement better. But, yeah, to watch, that, that's that been probably the thing that I enjoy the most as a coach is seeing an athlete putting that into play under pressure. Mm-hmm. Because you probably know that that is the that is the highest yield thing an athlete can possibly learn, right? Because that's going to affect the way they behave in the gym, out of the gym, um, in their re- everyday life. Those types of things have such a broad, such a huge impact on every single thing that they do. So focusing, you know, everybody's squatting, everybody's doing clean and jerks, everybody's doing it multiple times a week. Um, What everybody's not doing is focusing on these other things related to mindset that actually have an even bigger effect because they have a trickle down effect to the physical. Absolutely. It's going to be the way that I believe the way that you can perform the best that you possibly can. And again, when you learn that and you understand it, and you're like, oh, yeah, this is this is good stuff. And like you said, it trickles down into other movements mm-hmm. and, and everything else as well. So we're, it's time to wrap it up. Uh, we were talking beforehand about kind of, you know, what you're getting into these days and what you're passionate about. What are you what are you what are you up to? What do you want? Yeah, people you know, to know I, I think the first thing that I'll say is that, you know, I've gotten into probably way too many things through the years. And, and you know, I, I, I feel very blessed for that because you know, with the accomplishments that that I've made as an athlete and then coming into the CrossFit community in early 2010, there was such a huge opportunity and and I've probably gotten into way too many things which has taken away, you know, specific focus. You know, as an athlete, I was very focused on weightlifting and I did very good there. And what I learned as a professional is that I got way too scrambled. So Mm -hmm. for the last couple of years, I've been working on simplifying things down a little bit so I can do finding your three cues exactly yeah. simplifying it down so i can you know really make how can i make the biggest impact what what is really tugging on my heart what what do i what am i put on this earth to do and so i've you know struggled to find that out but as a even as a young kid my mom asked me uh what i want to do when i grow up and and i would always tell her it's general but i would always tell her i want to help people okay mm-hmm. so how can I best help people? And I think that's what we're all trying to figure out. Like Mm -hmm. we're all trying to figure out how we can make the biggest impact on this world. How can we help people? And in what way is that? And it's going to be different for, for every person. Um, so I've been trying to simplify that down and, and I'm still coaching right now. I don't coach that many classes throughout a week. I coach a couple CrossFit classes and, you know, a handful of weightlifting classes. So that doesn't take a lot of my time. I'm doing a little bit of online coaching on vonweightlifting.com. We have a um, uh, you know, three different programs that we mm-hmm. offer that I, that I have to keep up with. And then, um, you know, f- for the most part, what I'm most passionate about is, uh, is speaking. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I'm working on right now, um, finding ways to do that, looking for opportunities to go share my story. Um, I enjoy writing as well. And I think that's a part of being a speaker too. Um, I haven't been writing very much at all for the last couple years. 
And I think what I've just actually recently figured out with the couple books that I've been reading is that I've been waiting too long to find the perfect moment to do it. Mm -hmm. I just got to do it. Yeah. So I've been waiting too long to position myself and get things the way that, that I feel like they need to be done. And uh, it's just time to, to start doing these things that I, that I feel most passionate about, that I feel like um, I need to be doing. Um, I've written, uh, I have probably four or five CrossFit Journal articles. I've written for a couple of other different organizations. I actually wrote for a paper many years ago, and I didn't realize at the time how lucky I was to be in those situations to be, and to be doing um, what I what I enjoyed so much. And then uh, um, another thing that I, I told you I'm trying to back away from some things, right? Well, mm-hmm. I did just get um, asked to take a position on this new um, uh, competition concept. It's called World Series of Fitness, and it's a team competition concept. It was um, uh, the brainchild of a guy named John Rosenke. And John was a, or is, has been a life, lifelong um, creator and participant of um, team roping and rodeo associate, associations. And so he spent the last couple years gathering information and developing a team from within the fitness community to take some of those concepts into fitness competitions. Um, so I'm helping them out with the, with the weightlifting side of that and we're trying to get it all together and and get it going but it's an opportunity those concepts that we're bringing in is uh, basically a numbering system and so they're going to number each athlete or we're going to number each athlete and you don't have to team up with someone with the same number as you but the total number of your team is going to put you into a category and what we're really really wanting is and what we're going to create or what we have created is an opportunity for every level to compete that's already out there mm-hmm. but an opportunity for every level to win cash prizes so in team roping you don't have to be the best of the best to win a lot of money and that's the concept that, that we're trying to to bring in and and that's what we really want to reward we want to reward those athletes that are that are in the gym day in day out as well that are trying to be the best that they can be but you know maybe they're not the best of the best and maybe they're not going to be that athlete to go to the CrossFit Games and have that opportunity to go to other competitions and win money. I love it, man. I think uh, I I look at it kind of like golf. Like golf is really fun, but you bet $10 a hole and golf gets real fun, like real exciting. So yeah, I think it's a, I think it's an awesome uh, opportunity for people that, you know, really don't have a shot at making it to that, to that highest level. That's really cool. Um, all right, man. I really appreciate everything. This has been phenomenal. Anything you want to say before we wrap up? No, I just, I, I, again, I appreciate you coming down. I, I know you're not too far away from, yeah, from me yeah. now. You're, you're in Austin, and I'm in Belton. It's about an hour drive for you, yeah? Yep. So you have to come see me a little bit more often, or I'll try to make it up there uh, for you as well. But uh, thank you for having me on. Really enjoyed it. And, um, yeah, hopefully we can do it again. Absolutely, man. Where can they find you, keep up with you? Uh, our um, website is vaughnweightlifting.com. Uh, you can keep up with me on Instagram at Ollie Chad. That's O L Y C H A D. I try to do uh, you know at least one post a week. Probably need to do a better job at that. But uh, th- those are the main places uh, that you can keep up with me and and um, and uh, see what we're doing. Sounds great, man. And now you're on the hook to get that writing back up and going for about fifty thousand people. So we're all going to check up on you. I, man, I'm I'm ready. I'm ready. Right on, man. Thanks again. All right. Later. Thanks.